Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I was going to put everyone in for a uh, trick everybody and start speaking in French because um, I am I live in Montreal, uh, but I don't know if many of you will understand the French we speak. So uh, we'll just go with, we'll stick with English for today. So hi, everybody. My name is Mohamed. I'm the CEO at Vexhost. Um, I've been around OpenStack for quite a long time, uh, maybe 11 11, 12 years now. Um, I've had many roles inside OpenStack from the uh, being a member in the technical committee um, to being uh, the chair of the technical committee. I also currently sit as a board member in the Open Infra Foundation. Um, and I used to be the project team lead for a few different um, projects that you may be familiar with, such as uh, Puppet OpenStack or uh, uh, OpenStack Ansible. And I'm also a core uh, maintainer on a few other projects. Um, including uh, Magnum. And so um, maybe uh, very briefly, uh, is everyone here familiar with OpenStack? <laughs> um, is everyone here familiar with running uh, Magnum? Has everyone here ran Magnum? Um, has everyone here had a horrible experience running Magnum? Uh, so I see a lot of people uh, sighing yes. So that was, that was us. That's the whole point of this talk today. So for a long time, we were trying to convince people that um, OpenStack is the way to go um, with uh, running Kubernetes um, on-premise. And it turns out it was, but it was a very frustrating experience. And so what we decided to do is to figure out how we can make it better. Um, and so today what I want to do is share a little bit about um, a, an open source project that we built called the Cluster API Driver for Magnum. Um, and essentially what it does is connect um, OpenStack um, with the cluster API driver for OpenStack uh, using Kubernetes, which is a really reliable, really well-written uh, uh, implementation. Um, and so to explain a little bit about what the cluster API is, so the cluster API essentially, um, it's, an, it's a Kubernetes SIG project. And what it does is essentially they've taken all of the logic of creating a Kubernetes cluster, such as bootstrapping the, the, the certificates and everything around it, and they've taken that into a common ground and they've created separate providers. So there's an Azure provider, an AWS provider, um, an OpenStack provider. And those providers, their only job is create a virtual machine, delete a virtual machine, and just like the bare minimums. And so by doing that, we can share the code across all the different providers so that AWS doesn't have their own code and then OpenStack doesn't have its own code and so on. Um, and so essentially that's what the cluster API is. And then the Magnum for uh, Magnum driver essentially connects the cluster API, which is a Kubernetes um, thing with Magnum, which is an OpenStack thing and allows you to get, you know, very powerful on-premise um, Kubernetes. So believe it or not, this is the only slide that I have. Um, we're going to be in the terminal the whole time today. Um, and I ran it twice. So if it blows up, it's going to be a troubleshooting cluster API session, um, but hopefully not. Um, so one of the, the things that we're going to be running through is we're going to be creating cluster from scratch. Um, we're going to be looking into how to access the cluster. We're going to deploy some services. We're going to see how load balancer services will get created. Uh, and, and we're going to deploy workloads and that will show off how the auto scaling and auto healing works. And then finally, we'll actually upgrade the cluster um, all while we're sitting here. And the goal is to show just how simple it is. And the goal is to really show how this is really possible in an on-premise environment. People think that the best way to get Kubernetes is inside of a big, uh, a big data center, um, a big, big cloud data center, but you can have it in your own data centers. So um, here I've got um, a system that is running inside of our public cloud in Montreal. It's just a virtual machine. Uh, which is running Atmosphere, which is our OpenStack distribution. It's an upstream distribution of OpenStack, essentially runs on top of Kubernetes, um, and it includes all of this out of the box. Um, so here we can just do OpenStack COE cluster list and see that we don't have any clusters right now in the environment. Um, I'm not that crazy. I'll still copy paste some commands and I'll explain through them. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, so I'll run this because it takes a hot minute. But one thing to keep in mind throughout this, this example is, um, unfortunately, I'm not sleeping on, you know, many millions of IP addresses that I can just resell and retire off of. So for the uh, purposes of this demo, we're going to simply have the public uh, 
network be the 10.96.250.0/24. So whenever you see that, just imagine that's the public internet. Um, also, I see people moving up. Is it would it help to make the text bigger or is it uh, okay? Okay, so I'll do give two hints. Um, so here you'll see the command that I used to create the cluster, and essentially all I've done is say, hey, I want a Kubernetes 1.26.7 cluster. I'd like to have three master nodes, so three control plane nodes, um, and two nodes. Um, but you'll see something interesting because this two node is not gonna happen, and I'll explain why in a second. The next thing is we're gonna add labels, and we're gonna say that we actually want auto scaling to be enabled, and we want the minimum number of nodes to be one, and the maximum number of nodes to be three. The merge labels essentially says to take all those labels that we just defined and combine them with the original cluster template. And that's all that we've done. At this point, um, what we'll see is behind the scenes, the cluster API started to spin up everything. So here we see that actually we have a load balancer that's already been created. And this load balancer is going to be hosting the Kubernetes API. So since a fully high available control plane, we need to be running the, uh, uh, the uh, load balancer in front of it to uh, load balance the API servers. And we already see that it's in a pending update state. Um, and at this point it's in an active state. So it created a load balancer. And once again, I'm showing you this, but this is all just happening without us having to do anything. The next thing we'll actually do is look at the servers that are being created. So we can actually see that um, a server has already been created, which is this cube, Y2, one, uh, YQ, and whatever. Um, and essentially, this is a control plane node. So it actually just started with our first control plane node for this Kubernetes cluster, and it's currently in the process of bootstrapping the whole cluster for us. So um, what I'll do is I'll jump in another tab, and I'll pull in the cube config file for this cluster. So once I have that, and I'll just export the kubeconfig. So then I can do kubeconfig get nodes. So maybe we did this too early, or maybe we did it in time. Maybe we did it too early, and it's still deploying the cluster. Um, but essentially, what it's actually doing is doing a kubeadm in it, um, in the background, and it's um, you know creating the first replica of the uh, Kubernetes. There you go, we got no resources found. The node hasn't registered yet. So we've got our first node. Um, so at this point, we've got a single node and it's not ready yet. Um, and in the meantime, what I want to start to do um, while we wait for the rest of the cluster to get created is look at all the different components that automatically got installed in the cluster. Um, so looking uh, here, I'll go in the order that we see. Um, we get a CNI that gets installed by default. So in this case, it's Calico. We're also doing work right now on having Cilium installed out of the box. So you don't have to worry about a CNI. It all gets automatically installed with all the necessary security groups out of the box. Um, we have core DNS, which is the DNS function that's used in Kubernetes clusters. We automatically integrate with the, CS, the Cinder CSI plugin. So the Cinder CSI plugin essentially um, communicates with OpenStack's block storage service, Cinder, and automatically creates volumes and attaches them to the nodes that are running workloads in order to present a persistent volume to the VM in the same way that you would in, in a public cloud environment, for example. We also have the uh, CSI NFS controller, and this one actually, it goes along with the Manila CSI. So OpenStack Manila is another service of OpenStack, and this one doesn't provide block storage, but provides NFS shares. And so um, if you're thinking of Kubernetes terms, uh, uh, a read-write only would be a block storage. A read-write many would be an NFS share that you would end up getting created, and it would be mounted into all of your pods. Um, we've got the etcd kube API server, um, kube controller manager, and kube scheduler, which is just the components of the um, OpenStack, uh, sorry, the Kubernetes control plane. And we've got the cloud controller manager, which essentially helps um, create load balancers um, for different services. So when you create a load balancer type service, it'll automatically take care of this. So here you see that more things have appeared and that's because uh, more nodes have spawned. So by now we see that we've got two, um, uh, two uh, control plane nodes and we have a single uh, worker node at this point. And you see so far it's only been two minutes. So it's quite fast at pulling these up and if you wanted a bigger cluster, it would kind of run or take the same time. 
At the same time, if I go back to the server list, you'll actually see that all these new servers are automatically getting spawned um, in here. So this controller node um, and all of these workers. So once again, I'm, I'm showing you behind the scenes, but you wouldn't really be exposed to this. This would just happen um, in the same way that when you go to Azure and, and get a cluster or something like that, you would um, automatically get that. So while we wait for the third control plane node to go up uh, in the next few minutes, one thing I wanna keep in, in mind is you see that we've got our worker here and that's kind of the worker node, but we only have one. And the reason that we only have one is because we have auto scaling enabled. And so because we set the minimum number of nodes to one, auto scaling will not create more than one because well, that's just a waste of resources and we know that the minimum is one. In the same time as well, if these nodes are idle, it'll also scale down. So in this case, I set it to two, but because I, I, I don't have any workloads, the cluster is still empty, um, it's kind of gonna just stay that way. So hopefully here we got our, yeah, so you see the third node now has been created. Um, and then when we come back here in the next few seconds, we'll have our um, fully deployed um, Kubernetes cluster with just one command. Um, and I think this is really exciting because a lot of people struggle with dealing with uh, on-premise um, uh, Kubernetes clusters and there's all the struggles around how do I, you know, deal with persistent storage? How do I deal with, you know, load balancers and people use metal LB and things like that? And they add complexity, but when you're, you, when you're doing it inside VMs with something like OpenStack, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, so here we see that this last one has just come in. Um, and in the next few seconds, if we go to COE cluster list, uh, once that one becomes ready, uh, we'll see that create complete, but the health status is unhealthy. And that's because this node is not ready yet. Now that it's ready in the next few seconds, uh, it should hopefully become healthy and we'll be good to go. So as of now, we've created a Kubernetes cluster with one command. Um, inside of OpenStack that's fully integrated with the underlying cloud in the same way that you would um, have it in, um, in, a, in a public cloud environment like on an AWS or an Azure or something like that. Okay, well, it's gonna, it's gonna get there. So while we uh, wait for all of this to, to sort out, so the next challenge that I see a lot of people have is persistent uh, workloads and persistent volumes and um, you know, how do you deal with that? Because obviously it's it's hard to, to manage that and the clouds make it easy because you just create a persistent volume and everything happens um, under the hood. So um, what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna pull in the MariaDB um, chart from Bitnami and I'm just gonna install it. What we'll, this will do um, is it will actually create a pod with MariaDB, but more importantly, it has created a persistent volume in the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And so what's really cool is um, you see this persistent volume is mapped to this storage uh, block RBD1 storage class. And this one maps directly into OpenStack. So if I actually go to OpenStack um, volume list, we can actually see that this volume, the same exact PVC is actually was created automatically and was attached into the worker where this pod. So here we see this worker ending 47 WFT. And we can see uh, if we do a wide that it's running on 47 WFT. And this is all happening transparently. All the attaching and detaching is all happening um, automatically. And we'll see more of that when we do the upgrade and it's gonna do the evacuate and actually move the workload from one host to another without us having to, to do anything. Um, so, that's kind of it when it comes to persistent volumes. So now another really common use case is, well, um, I need auto scaling for my workloads because I can't just have a whole bunch of nodes running all the time. Um, and I need um, a load balancer uh, to expose my services. Generally in the public clouds, you'll use a, a network load balancer, any sort of load balancer. So um, what I'm gonna do is here, go back into this tab and pretty much um, install uh, an instance of uh, Ingress Nginx. So Ingress Nginx is essentially a Kubernetes ingress that um, is built based on Nginx. It's a community project and what it allows you to do is pretty much to create ingress resources and then it will automatically take care of routing those ingress resources into the cluster. 
Um, so while it's doing that, I'll run this watch. And so now here we see this ingress nginx controller um, and there is a pending external IP. Uh, and the reason for that is if we go back here behind the scenes again, and we look at the list of load balancers, we see that there's a new load balancer that's actually in a pending create state. So as you created that cluster, uh, that type load balancer resource inside Kubernetes, the cluster that already is pre-integrated, you don't have to do anything, it automatically communicated to the OpenStack deployment and said, hey, I need you to create a load balancer because I need to be able to serve this load balancer um, type service. And so this takes usually, you know, uh, a few minutes. And once this will be up and running, it will be routing directly to that um, ingress nginx service. And we can actually start to push workloads that are using an ingress. So here you see that it's active. And when I go back, I can actually see that the external IP has already been assigned to this. Now, if you remember at the start, I said it's going to be a 1096 uh, because otherwise I'd be retiring with the amount of IPs that um, I would have. So if we actually just do a curl on it, we'll see that we get a 404. So we're hitting the load balancer IP and getting a 404 from Nginx because there's nothing installed yet. So this one, this next thing is, there's a deployment of a small project called PodInfo. And what PodInfo is essentially is a simple pod that says where it's running and, and small information that tells you the name of the pod. The purpose of what I'm gonna use it for is two things right now. The first one is to show how autoscaling works. So if we look into this um, config here, we'll see that I created an affinity, a pod anti-affinity rule, which is based on the host name of the system. So what I've said is, I don't want any of the pods of um, the pod info to be running uh, on the same host as another one. And the purpose of this is to pretty much say, um, I just need one version of it or one replica on every host. This is something you would use, let's say if you're running a database system and you don't wanna have all of your pods ending up on the same host. But the purpose of this is you'll notice I have two replicas and we only have one worker node. So I guess the question is what's gonna happen when we have two replicas and they can't, and we cannot, and we only have one worker node and they cannot be on the same host. So I'll run this here. Um, that's not the one here, it's this one. And so you'll see here that I got the application URL where it's running. So this is, um, if you're not familiar, nip.io is essentially a very, very simple, stupid service where it just allows you to get a host name for something. So really this resolves to the same IP, um, but I just used it in order to make it easier to, to do the curl for the ingress. And if I do a curl now, I get a response. But if I do a get pods, you'll see that I got one pending pod because Kubernetes is saying, I don't know where to replace this. I don't have a place to put this. But the really interesting thing here is if I do a describe on this pod, and also you'll notice that the host name here matches the host name of the pod here. But what's really cool is the auto scaling comes in place. So here the auto scaling essentially said, well, I have no place to put this. Um, the only place to put it the only way I can make this happen is if I need more nodes. So this is where it started and the cluster autoscaler triggered an, uh, an autoscale event. And when you look at the number of the nodes, we actually see that a new node five seconds ago just showed up. Um, and when you look at the pods, well, once this node becomes ready, um, then that pod will eventually schedule onto that node and the workload will start uh, being served from there. So here it's still not ready, or it's ready now. So if you'll remember, the host name that was uh, working before was the one ending in VZ, uh, well, 9NX. Now if I do the curl, let's see here. I guess it's still starting up. Yeah, it's still starting up. But essentially, once it finishes starting it up, it will eventually start to do uh, uh, load balancing across the two pods, and we'll actually start to see the one ending with um, N2R showing up. So here, if we do a curlier again, you see now we're getting served from the other one. So, and this is all, you know, again, an OpenStack deployment that can be running on-premise, so this is all things that you could be doing um, without needing 
you know, a big public cloud. This is going to be running inside your own hypervisors and things could be scaling up or down um, based on need and demand. Um, and then, well, one of the other key things that, you know, will maybe be interesting and we'll say, well, okay, um, I've got a, a host that just disappeared or died because uh, that happens, right? Um, so here I'm going to go ahead and grab one of the, the host that was actually just created, this worker, and I'm just going to delete it. So what I just did is to simulate a failure. Um, hypervisors can go down, things can go bad. Um, this node can crash for many other reasons, but essentially what I've done here is to simulate a failure that the cube node is not uh, it dies in one way or another. So essentially here, what we're gonna see is um, right now, Kubernetes still hasn't picked up that this has failed. But what's gonna happen now in the next few seconds is that node is gonna become not ready and it's gonna be automatically removed by um, Kubernetes. And then what's gonna happen after is the auto healing will come in play and say, well, I've realized that this node just disappeared and I need to replace it because I need to have at least two nodes uh, to sustain my workload. So you'll see it, it's, it's gone from the cluster already here. Um, and if we watch the server list, and it should just take a couple of seconds, um, and what it will do is it will create that new node to replace the one that just died and disappeared. Um, and that's obviously really useful because, well, there it is, that's a new node right there without even dealing with anything. So anything that crashes, anything, any problems are all automatically uh, solved and uh, taken care of. So in the next few seconds, this node will be back. The pod that was scheduled on it will go back up and everything will be uh, back up and alive uh, with no issues. So we'll just give it a few more seconds here uh, for it to show up and then what I want to say is uh, start preparing your questions because the next step is upgrading a cluster. So upgrading a cluster is super, super easy and super straightforward. Once again, it's just one command to give it. So in this case, we see we've got a 1.267 cluster. Um, I'll walk through very briefly how the uh, cluster upgrade process is working. Uh, so you see here it's creating that new replacement container which is uh, FQL84. And then in the next few seconds, I should have probably prepared more filler talk for uh, waiting for Kubernetes to do things, you know? There you go, we're running. And now if we curl that again, you'll see this is the original VZ9 and we've got the FQL, so all automatically. And I kind of want to focus on like, everything we've done here is pure Kubernetes. We haven't understood anything about OpenStack. We don't know how it's all working. We don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but it's just, it's happening behind the scenes and it's all getting taken care of. The only OpenStack commands that we've really used is the creation of the cluster, which can also be done with Terraform or can be done with Ansible or whatever. And this next one, which is actually the upgrade of the cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and trigger an upgrade to upgrade this cluster to 1.27.8. Um, and this usually takes around you know five to six minutes uh, once it does it. But the way that it works is essentially it will start to do a full rolling update. So it will spin up a new control plane node using the new version and then evacuate one of the control plane nodes and then delete it and then keep doing that for the control plane nodes. Once the control plane is fully upgraded and running the new version, it'll start doing the same process for the uh, worker nodes and by evacuating workloads, waiting for them to evacuate, deleting the node and, and doing a full rolling restart without you having to really intervene and just let it, it do its thing. So while this is waiting and running, um, I'm hoping that you've got some questions for me. Um, so I would love to hear them while we wait for this. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm yes. Yeah. So to summarize, 
Yeah, I'll summarize the question for the recording is, um, you know, you notice that we're using and talking to the Magnum side or COE cluster. Uh, how does that tie into the cluster API? So um, this is a thing that is like uh, act actually the other way around. So the driver is actually the cluster, it's a cluster API driver for Magnum using the OpenStack provider. So essentially what we do is when we create a cluster inside Magnum, this driver that we've built, essentially if we go in here, it creates a cluster inside, um, it creates a cluster inside of the cluster API um, on the, in what we call the management cluster, if you're familiar with the cluster API references. And it pretty much takes all of the different things that we have given to it. So for example, here, you know, we said we, we have all these different, you know, values that we can enable and disable. We've got the auto scaler. So essentially before Magnum used to be this complex thing that would create heat stacks and push them to heat. Now it's actually doing the same thing, but except it's generating YAML and pushing it to the Kubernetes where cluster API is then actioning and, and doing all of that. So if we look into Capo system, which is the um, Capo controller manager, you can see the logs for it. Um, and it's kind of doing the reconciling and creating of machines and everything, like creating network components and, and all of that. So that's all happening there. Um, and I have a slide here that I was gonna share at the end, which includes the link to the actual driver, uh, advanced thrift. So essentially this is the driver where things kind of happen. Um, and as you'll see, it's kind of just an implementation. So when you go to, uh, when is there's a create cluster, essentially it calls into the create cluster, which creates all the different resources that are necessary on your behalf. So the idea is that users don't have to either have their own management cluster for CAPI, nor do they have to understand how uh, CAPI and CAPA works. For them, they can use the same Terraform code or Ansible code or the CLI that they used to work with Magnum and it'll just work out of the box without them having to do anything. Yeah, so um, we have, so the question about if the management cluster is pre-configured by an admin. So in Atmosphere, we deploy OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. So that we already have a management cluster, we just reuse that. Um, but the, the Cola Ansible also supports the driver. And as far as I know, there's been people that have uh, set up Kind um, to do that. So if we look at the, um, uh, the logs for uh, the documentation, we've had a few people that have shared an awesome, that have written some nice blog posts about how to use it with OpenStack Ansible, for example. Um, so both with, with OpenStack Ansible, the code actually includes the portion to create a management cluster. Uh, with Cola Ansible, it, it assumes that you are bringing your own um, management cluster. You just have to give it a kubeconfig and make sure the providers are, are installed. So, but because we're deploying on Kubernetes, like all of the um, OpenStack components that we deploy, I mean, you see it's, uh, nope, not this one. You see everything here, Sunland, RabbitMQ, all of our components are already there, so we, we just reuse that same system. And then while we get our next question, you'll see that we already have two nodes that have been replaced with the new version, and the third one is on its way to getting replaced, and hopefully the rest will get done. Hopefully I have more questions, yes. Can you please say something about the, the underlying network? So which, what do you need? Do you use VLANs or plane or switches or whatsoever? Yeah. So um, for the actual workload clusters, by default, the cluster API will create a VXLAN network in Neutron. So in the same way that you would create a tenant network, um, just a normal tenant network, it would just um, rely on that. The way that... Um, and then inside the cluster, like I showed earlier, is Calico as the CNI. The communication between control plane, and when I say control plane, is like management cluster into the workload clusters, aka the cluster we just created. That um, 
In old school Magnum, the cluster would dial out to the control plane. Um, but with cluster API, the cluster API dials out to the cluster. Um, and so the issue with that is when uh, with Magnum, we can easily create what we call isolated clusters. So right now, this cluster has a floating IP. That's how the API is exposed. You might not want that. Um, so in order to get an isolated cluster where the there is no floating IP, we created a component called the Magnum Cluster API Proxy. And this will run on all of your hosts. If you're using ML2 OVS, you would run it on all of your network hosts where DHCP and L3 agents are running. And if you're running OVN, you would run it on your compute hosts. And what it does is eventually it, ex it exposes um, through the na network namespace into the network or the exposes the API through the network namespace as a Kubernetes service. Um, and that's how that communication goes out. But inherently, as, as uh, um, the, this solution, if you're not going to be using floating IPs, or even if you use this, there's no specific network requirements that are done. It's just it needs an OpenStack installation. So nothing beyond what your normal OpenStack installation would, would include. So we've got already have the whole control plane moved. And we've got one uh, worker node at 1.27. So we'll do another question while we wait, maybe, if someone has anything. Last call. <laughs> well, um, in that case, uh, we'll just, you know, trust me that this upgrade will finish successfully. Um, we already have one that was finished. And you're all, you'll see that um, the other nice thing here is that the workloads um, have already been moved to this new, this new node. So the one with uh, Z and ZNRMM already has workloads that have been moved to it as well. Um, and then the other kind of interesting thing to just uh, quickly uh, call out is uh, you'll see that this pod here has been moved to another node. And if we go back to the volume list, we'll just see that it actually migrated the attachment from one host to another. So it automatically realizes that this pod is no longer on this worker. So it's going to move it from one host uh, to another host. And again, we've only interacted with two commands with OpenStack, which is create a cluster and upgrade it. And the rest is pure Kubernetes. So this is really powerful if you want to start bringing Kubernetes on premise. Um, and not have to deal with any potential headaches or, or problems uh, because it's very simple and people don't have to actually know OpenStack. You, you know, I've always said uh, you don't have to tell people it's OpenStack. They might get, you know, ah, it's OpenStack, it's old. Just tell them it's Kubernetes and, and they'll be happy. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think the last thing that I wanted to share at this point is we've got, so we've got all of our nodes all fully upgraded at this point. And the last thing that I wanted to share is this here. So this is a list of all the different open source projects that we are, are running. Um, this is what I usually call the take a photo of the slide. Um, Atmosphere essentially is what we use to deploy all of this, uh, which is an open source way of deploying OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. The Magnum cluster API is what we've used to build all of these clusters. And essentially all these other things are all different various open source, OpenStack related projects that we've built in order to kind of make OpenStack better, whether it's around authentication with KeyCloak, whether it's around uh, just general you know, collections, because Atmosphere at the end of the day is an Ansible collection. So if you want a collection to deploy Ceph and you don't care about the rest, it's all kind of um, split out into different modules so you can just use those if you need to. And uh, yeah, if there's no more questions, I'm good to go. Thank you very much, everybody.